Welcome to the third and final installment of my Pokemon Go critique. In the first video, I talked about the issues surrounding Pokestops, eggs, and the buddy system. While in the second video, I talked about the issues surrounding gyms, currencies, and capturing Pokemon. If you haven't seen those videos yet, then I would recommend watching them before this one, but you're welcome to watch them afterwards instead. In this video, I'll be covering the issues surrounding the level slope, the luck-based game elements, as well as how the game has changed since the introduction of Generation 2 and Special Events. And at the end, I will summarize my thoughts from all three videos into my final conclusions about Pokemon Go. So without further ado, let's do this. 8. Level Slope If you're a dedicated Pokemon Go player, then you're probably already well aware of the level up requirements and how they ramp up exponentially beyond level 20. Within the first two weeks that Pokemon Go was released, I had made it from level 1 to level 20. But in the nine months since September, I've barely gone up three levels. To put this into perspective, players at level 20 are just over 10% of their way to level 30, while players at level 30 are exactly 10% of the way to level 40. This means that players at level 20 are barely more than 1% of the way to max level. Having levels scale exponentially robs players of the true value of their efforts. In Pokemon Go in particular, this encourages players to purchase lucky eggs while sinking an unreasonable amount of time to the game in an attempt to feed their needs of addiction. The experience points never increase for capturing Pokemon with a higher CP level, despite the fact that they are much more difficult to capture. If the amount of experience points required to level up scaled linearly past level 10, then players that are currently level 40 in Pokemon Go would instead be over level 200. I think that Pokemon Go would be a much more fair game if levels scaled linearly, Pokemon became proportionately easier to capture as your trainer level increased, if the experience points gained from capturing Pokemon increased proportionately to the combat power and form stage of the captured Pokemon, and if the amount of Pokemon candies obtained from transferring Pokemon was proportionate to their combat power and form stage. These changes would reward players proportionately for their efforts as well as for the true value of their Pokemon. It would make leveling up, capturing, and transferring Pokemon much more rewarding in a way that's much more fair to players. 9. Luck-Based Game Elements In the original script for this video, I was going to talk about the individual values of Pokemon, because there was a design error that existed in Pokemon Go that tilted the randomly generated statistics in favor of Pokemon that appeared further down in the Pokedex. Thankfully, Niantic was able to fix this design issue by late September of last year, but for anyone curious, it meant that Pokemon like Charmander, Squirtle, and Bulbasaur that appear in the lower portion of the Pokedex had a ceiling limit on their battling potential, while Pokemon like Magikarp, Eevee, and Dratini were substantially more likely to have competitively viable stats. This certainly had its pros and cons for players, but regardless, it was a design error in the game and I'm glad that Niantic was able to patch it. My only real concern with inherent values now is that players don't have any control over the evolution of new Pokemon like Tyrogue. In Nintendo Pokemon games, players are able to train their Tyrogue in order to control whether it'll evolve into a Hitmonchan, Hitmonlee, or Hitmontop. I would love to be able to evolve my Tyrogue into a Hitmontop, but since I'm unable to augment its stats through training, there's currently nothing I can do to stop it from evolving into a Hitmonlee. This may seem like a small issue, but it's yet another example of choice that exists in Nintendo's games, but not Niantic's. Similarly, players spend weeks grinding to catch, hatch, and evolve the best Pokemon possible, only for the game to randomly decide their moves on your behalf. I spent 8 months hunting down and capturing Dratinis in order to finally have enough candies to evolve my best one into a Dragonite, and yet it's been cursed with the worst moves possible. The experience left me feeling absolutely defeated. Players who captured wild Dragonites during the first week of the game's release are guaranteed to have an equal or superior moveset to mine, despite how much effort I put into earning it. It matters more that you're in the right place at the right time than it is that you're a dedicated player. It robs players of their enjoyment and punishes their dedication. Pokemon Go often feels more like a casino game than it does a Pokemon game. The Pokemon that players encounter are always the same as any other player around them. A player's level doesn't increase their chances of encountering rare Pokemon in the wild. Pokemon encounter rates never improve as you level up or progress through the game, and Pokemon are never upgraded to their evolved forms if you have a higher player level. Your level only ever seems to work against you, and it feels completely unfair. 10. Events The new events and the new generation added in Pokemon Go have added a lot of depth to the game in really interesting ways. By the end of the summer, I had largely stopped playing the game, but the myriad of events and the release of Generation 2 temporarily pulled me back into the game. The Halloween event was awesome. 
players received double candy from capturing, hatching, and transferring Pokemon. Buddy Pokemon gave candy rewards four times faster and the appearance of scary Pokemon increased substantially. This is how you do events. The Christmas and Valentine's Day events were fantastic for a lot of the same reasons. Christmas increased the odds of encountering the Kanto starter Pokemon and rewarded players with free temporary egg incubators for swiping Pokestops each day. While the Valentine's Day event mirrored nearly everything from the Halloween event, but it had an increase of pink Pokemon instead of spooky ones. That said, I was really surprised at Easter, because the extravaganza event was more of a sale than anything else. Lucky eggs were 50% off, and rare Pokemon had a chance of hatching from 2k eggs, but that feels more like an incentive to purchase egg incubators than it does as a reward to players. Before players even have a chance to hatch rare Pokemon, they need to walk far enough to clear space in their inventory and hope that they pick up 2km eggs. Easter is the holiday that focuses on eggs and candy, but both felt as if they were given away sparingly while simultaneously asking for more and more money from players. Players received candy multipliers at Valentine's Day and during Adventure Week, but not at Easter, and that seems incredibly bizarre to me. A lot of the smaller events have also been lackluster in comparison, and they feel like appetizers to appease players until more prominent events return. 11. Generations I absolutely love some of the new mechanics that Generation 2 brought to Pokemon Go. Receiving additional candies from capturing Pokemon of a higher evolution stage is a step in the right direction, and although I love this mechanic and concept, I don't think that it was implemented properly. Capturing an evolved Pokemon is already a reward for players since they'll save candies by not having to evolve the lower form. It would make more sense to me if players received these additional candies when transferring higher evolved Pokemon, not when capturing them. Giving players candies based on the transferred Pokemon's power level and evolutionary stage would make the game much more fair to players proportionate to the amount of difficulty it took to capture, power up, and evolve the Pokemon. Gen 2 also introduced two new berries. The Pinat Berry, that doubles the amount of candy received from a successfully captured Pokemon, and the Nana Berry, that makes Pokemon's movements less erratic. I love Pinat Berries because they get me that much closer to obtaining rarer evolutions, but I'm constantly discarding Nana Berries from my inventory in order to make room for more useful items. If Niantic wanted to make it easier for players to capture erratic Pokemon, then I think that a practice mode would have been a much more valuable inclusion to the game. Being able to practice throws on more difficult targets would add a lot of depth to the game. There's actually a lot of evolutions of Pokemon that I've never encountered in the wild before, and it'd be really interesting to experience capturing them. The new element that I find the most disappointing in Generation 2 is the evolutionary items. If players want to evolve any of their first gen Pokemon into their second gen counterpart, then they're going to have to obtain the appropriate evolutionary item. I honestly can't think of any reason to introduce these items now, except to artificially extend the playtime required from players in order to capture them all. Evolutionary items are guaranteed to drop from 7 day Pokestop streaks, but have an estimated 1 in a thousand chance of dropping from Pokestops otherwise. This means that on average, it'll take most players a minimum 8 weeks of continuous Pokestop spinning in order to obtain the evolutionary items they need, and that's only if they're lucky. There's nothing stopping you from getting multiple duplicates, and there's nothing guaranteeing that you'll get the ones you need. What's twice as unfortunate is that even when players use an evolutionary item to evolve their Pokemon, they still have to give the same amount of Pokemon candies. That's right. If you want to evolve your Poliwhirl into a Poliwrath, it's going to cost you 100 Pokemon candies. But if you want to evolve your Poliwhirl into a Politoad, then that's going to cost you 100 Pokemon candies and a King's Rock. How come I need a King's Rock to get a Politoad, but I don't need a Water Stone to get a Poliwrath? If players were able to use the evolutionary items instead of the Pokemon candies, then I'd welcome it with open arms. But that's not the case. It's yet another barrier that's been added to the game in order to artificially extend gameplay. While on the topic of Generations 2 Extended Evolutions, I also want to talk about Crobat and Kingdra. They're the only Pokemon introduced in second generation that evolves from a second stage Pokemon from generation 1. When generation 2 was introduced, the amount of candies required to evolve Zubat and Horsey was reduced from 50 to 25. I appreciate that there was a cost reduction, but Niantic made it in the least logical place. In order to evolve a Goldbat into a Crobat or a Seedra into a Kingdra, it costs the player 100 candies. Although this is standard for most second stage Pokemon, this means that anyone who evolved their Zubat or Horsey before Generation 2 will end up exchanging a total of 150 candies for their Crobat and Kingdra instead of 125. If they had left it at 50 candies for the first evolution but reduced the second evolution from 100 candies down to 75, then it would still total 125 candies from start to finish, and wouldn't inadvertently punish legacy players. 
This issue also exists moving forward, since many Pokemon have tertiary evolutions introduced in 4th gen, and that makes me reluctant to evolve any of the Pokemon from those families now. What I find especially confusing about this issue is that it doesn't exist with any of the Pokemon families that had baby Pokemon introduced as tertiary members. The release of 2nd gen has introduced even more Pokemon that I've been completely unable to obtain. Even when excluding Legendaries, Regionals, and Chansey, I'm still missing more than half a dozen Pokemon. It's understandable that I'm still missing Unknown, but it's frustrating that I've been completely unable to obtain Politoed, Hitmontop, Cleffa, Iglybuff, Togepi, or Magby. I've hatched numerous elect kids and I've had enough candies to evolve a Poliwhirl since 2nd gen released, but without any luck on my side, more and more Pokemon will continue to evade me. Believe it or not, I actually have a Blissey and a Togetic, but I've never even seen a Chansey or a Togepi. Sometimes I feel like I'm incredibly lucky, but the rest of the time it can be nearly impossible to catch a break. 12. Conclusion I want to make it absolutely clear that I'm an avid gamer and I'm a huge fan of Pokemon. Pokemon Sapphire was the first video game that I ever owned, and despite how I might sound in these videos, I actually have a strong bias in favor of Pokemon games. When I started making these videos, I still hadn't obtained Venusaur, Charizard, Kabutops, Dragonite, Hitmonlee, Chansey, or Lapras. Since then, I've been lucky enough to encounter Hitmonlee and Lapras. I've been lucky enough to hatch a Dratini, which helped me get enough candies for my Dragonite. And the New Year's event allowed me to collect enough candies to finally evolve Venusaur and Charizard. Chansey still eludes me, but hey, what can you do? I love Pokemon Go for what it could be, and I hope that one day it can be the game that I've always wanted. I'm torn. I know that the game will get better as new mechanics are introduced, but all of the game elements that attempt to nickel and dime players keep me from wanting to support this game. Pokemon Go became the top grossing game in the App Store. When you financially support companies in that way, you're telling game developers that they can get away with this kind of behavior. I've stopped playing Pokemon Go for the second time now, but as the weather warms up and if Niantic finally releases trading, battling, and raids, then I expect that many players, myself included, will flood back into the game. But my fear is that history will repeat itself. The game will blow up for two weeks in the middle of summer, and then everyone will stop playing again. Ever since Pokemon Red and Blue released internationally, players around the world have wanted a game like Pokemon Go. I remember running around in the streets as a little kid and pretending to capture invisible creatures that weren't there. So when Pokemon Go released, it was so satisfying to see it go viral. Everyone knew about it and a ton of people were playing it. But due to the myriad of gimmicks and flaws, as well as a lack of features and content, everyone quickly lost interest. Pokemon Go started as an April Fool's Day joke, and I still feel like I'm being punked. I hope that if anyone from Niantic watches this video, that they understand that I mean no ill will towards them. I've made a number of recommendations in these videos that I think could make what is currently a good game a potentially amazing one. And the reason I do that is because I want to see this game get better and better, and I know that Niantic wants that too. I've said before that I think Pokestops should be removed from the game. I have nothing against interactive geographic locations themselves, but Pokestops inadvertently punish rural players and prevent them from playing and enjoying the game. If Pokestops were changed into NPCs and players received resources from walking, that would still kind of suck for rural players, but at least they'd be able to enjoy capturing Pokemon. That would also make a lot more sense since people tend to gravitate towards cities. Overall, through Pokemon Go, there are still so many things that players can't control like eggs, movesets, and even the appearances of Pokemon like Ditto. I've caught so many Pidgeys, Rattatas, and Zubats, hoping that they would transform into Ditto. I have hundreds of their respective candies with nothing to do with them. If there was some way for me to convert their candies into typing energies, then at least I'd be able to use them in some way for my normal and flying type. Being able to crunch Pokemon candies into Stardust would be incredibly useful as well. If the game would just stop nickel and diming players all the time and remove the barriers that prevent them from having fun and progressing throughout the game, then I think that this would honestly be what I consider to be the perfect game. I'm really glad that they've introduced the buddy system. I'm glad that they've been working to improve the gym experience in the past, and that they're continuing to do so in the future. I'm really glad that they fixed the technical issues with the IVs, and I've been really enjoying the introduction of new events and generations, despite the shortfalls. These mechanics are all fantastic introductions, but there's still a lot to fix. If even one recommendation I've made makes it into the game, then that's already one more step in the right direction. If there's even a chance that someone at Niantic will see this video, then I'm happy with all the effort I've put into this project. Thank you for watching my videos, and hey, what do you think? Are you still playing Pokemon Go? Why or why not? And if you could fix one thing in Pokemon Go, what would it be? 
I'm already working on my next video game critique, so if you want to see what I have to say about new video games that have been released this year, then click that subscribe button in order to follow along in the future. I'm really excited for this next video, so stick around and I hope I see you again next time.